Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to the first of our Truth for a Change talks here at the fantastic Kitchen Town Hall. Um, I'd just like to draw your attention to our fire exits on the side here, and ask you politely if you would please make sure that your telephones are on silent. Thank you. This is the first of four talks that are going to be every fortnight here at the Town Hall. The first one, as you can see, is on biodiversity. Next week, we've, um, next fortnight, we've got uh, sustainable fashion and a life with less. Then the fortnight after that, we have uh, Rupert Reed is going to do the truth talk, which will be um, something to look forward to. And then uh, the final one will be uh, transport. So hopefully, if you enjoy yourselves today, we'll see you again at one or more of the others as well. The main reason we're here is to learn facts and truth, because there's so much different stuff flying about on the news. We're not really sure what to focus on, what to believe, and we thought it's time that uh, we told you the truth, and hopefully we can learn how we can move forward from that. So, I'm very, very pleased to be welcoming onto the stage our first speaker this evening, the co-leader of the Green Party, Mr. Jonathan Barkley. Thank you very much indeed. Such a great pleasure. This looks like an amazing uh, collection of talks. I think Rupert Reed will be incredibly entertaining. I would thoroughly uh, recommend coming on to hear him. Um, I'm the warm up act really, uh, today. Um, and it's really exciting to be here talking about biodiversity at this moment. There was a time when we talk about biodiversity, we met with raised eyebrows, but recently awareness has grown that biodiversity encompasses every living thing on Earth and how we interact and support each other is fundamental to absolutely everything we're fighting for. We've seen it in the outcry against the passage of new generations, growing sense that there is no somewhere else which can endlessly absorb the most perpetual economic growth. We've seen it in the swelling support for safer bees and all that growing knowledge that we are, are truly inter- all the web of life here on Earth. And it's been fantastic, fantastic to see Extinction Rebellion here, and it's been fantastic to see the school strikers, our young people, showing the leadership that our country so desperately needs. It's been notable by its absence from the political class over the last few years. Things are changing. An awareness of the diversity of the plants, the creatures living in our oceans and on land, has made our planet a unique place for humans, that this diversity is absolutely fundamental to life on Earth, but the awareness that this is now under threat. And we are understanding that the health of ecosystems on which we and other species depend is deteriorating more rapidly than ever. That we are eroding the very foundations of our economies, of our livelihoods, our food, our security, our health, and our quality of life worldwide. Right now, we are destroying the foundations of our economy faster than they can be regenerated. We are eroding the very ground that we stand on. That's why I get so furious when I see the loose like HS2, a white elephant bounty project set to trample its way through over a hundred ancient ruins across the UK. And for what? Shave a few minutes of the journey. Through Birmingham and London to try and stimulate the modicum of economic growth, to increase capacity for more consumption. Again and again and again, our natural world is sacrificed on the altar of gross domestic product without ever asking the fundamental question who the economy is really for. But building a successful economy is not a policy of protecting our environment, it is not impossible. Without it. You haven't read eight very words for a fellow land economist. Get it and read it. Yeah. The challenge is the old industrial model. She challenges the old mechanistic industrial model and uh, suggests a total alternative and organic model of the economy, asking that fundamental question who the economy is for. 
If our planet's 4.6 billion year history was compressed into a year, my children's generation would be contained in that last fraction of the last second. Three seconds back, Columbus set sail from America. Ten seconds back, the Roman Empire fell. Just under a minute before that is when human civilization started to kick off. That's under a minute in the whole year of planetary existence. And during that single minute is when human beings have pushed life on Earth to where it is now. Nature is in crisis. Intensive agriculture, as George Monbiot puts it, the erasure of non-human life from the land of farming is happening so fast it's almost too hard to comprehend. Hundreds of thousands of plants and animals are being ravaged to extinction from human activity. A third of our oceans over harvested Africa are set to lose 50% of its animal and plant species in the next 30 years. The extinction of plants and animals is irreversible. So is the damage that this poses to human life on Earth. The range of human activities, unsustainable consumption of production patterns, and the growing pressure on our natural resources due to global heating makes the loss of biodiversity an ever increasing problem. What we need more than anything is for world leaders to wake up and put diversity at the very top of their agenda. It's not the same as climate change, but it goes hand in hand with climate breakdown. When we lose fish and plants from our oceans en masse, and when we, our waterways are clogged with pollution, when we concrete over green spaces, we lose, vital, we lose vital carbon sinks. When plant diversity shrivels up due to fertilizers and intensive agriculture, and our forests become dominated by invasive species and produce less oxygen for us to breathe. Scientists say that deforestation in tropical rainforests adds more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than the sum total of all the cars and trucks on the world's roads. And the deforestation and forest degradation together are by far the main source of national greenhouse gas emissions. Biodiversity loss can be seen in everything from the loss of hedgehogs and bees in bridge gardens, hedgehogs, right to forest fires engulfing the Amazon, which is home 10% of the world's known species. It's time our environment was the lens through which we see every economic decision. During the Paris Climate Talks, activists blasted the same message across the city. We are nature defending itself. We need, to, we need nature to breathe, to drink clean water, to feed us. We need nature to hold carbon, to prevent further climate breakdown. We need the nature to fulfill our lives, to excite us, to bring us a little bit of beauty into our everyday. The good news, as I said at the beginning of my talk, is that it feels like we are at a pivotal point of public outcry over the state of the natural world. And as Greens, we're ready to harness that desire to reconnect, to renew and to replenish. We'll introduce a new Environmental Protection Act, which would ensure strong protections for our natural parks, our green belts, and other aspects of our environment. And we create a new environmental regulator and court to make sure that these laws are enforced. We'd have teeth to stand up to wealth. We'd have the teeth to stand up to capital. We promote a new network of interlinking logical, ecologi local ecological spaces on both land and sea, ensuring that both our wildest places and urban green spaces are protected and allowed to flourish we enshrine access to nature as a right for every single person in the UK. Now is the time to rebuild the connection between the British public and the natural world of which we are a part. Too long we've been alienated from our land, from the living networks upon which we depend, upon which we build our society, our economy and our lives. And finally, we also need brilliant scientists and academics like the one I'm about to introduce who have been leading the way on scientific research into biodiversity. I firmly believe that the science is what saving our planet comes down to, not political infighting and negotiating, not profitable endeavors by entrepreneurs, but following the facts, the truth, the scientists have been telling us for decades. When 16-year-old Greta Thunberg addressed US Congress last week, she said, don't listen to me, listen to the scientists. 
you watch the video of her address, you can see how utterly bemused she looks. And she's asked why Congress should be listening to the science. As if following the scientific evidence on climate change is something that should be up for debate. We're very lucky this evening to have bioscientists from a world-leading university to talk to us. Dr. Tim Newbold is a research fellow at the University College of London. He completed his PhD on distribution models as a tool for understanding the impacts of climate on biodiversity at the University of Nottingham. Please welcome Dr. Tim Newbold. Well, if that was a warm-up act, I'd say it's a very difficult one to follow. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm Tim Newbold. I'm based at University College London, just, just down the train line from here. Um, and, I, and I'm based in the Centre for Biodiversity Environment Research, where we do a lot of, lot of this research into biodiversity loss. And it's worth pointing out before before I get going, really, that you know, science is, science is a very collaborative endeavour, and so of course everything that I talk about today is is work that's been done together with a set of fabulous colleagues. Um, so this is my research group um, at UCL, um, and also I have a, a network of, of wonderful collaborators all over the world <coughs> um, that have made it possible to do the, the things that I'll talk about today, and, and particularly the four people shown on the left here, um, they, they've been instrumental in, what, in, in, the, in the work that I'll talk about today. And of course, none of this gets done without, without money, and, and you know, I'm very grateful to several funding bodies for um, providing the means to, to do my research, and, and particularly the Royal Society, who currently pay the most part of my salary. Um, is everybody able to hear me OK at the back? I'm not sure I've got this microphone attached 100% securely, so if I suddenly get quiet in the middle of the talk, and start waving at me or something. Um, so Jonathan's already done a fantastic job of introducing some of the um, some of the science that's been going on in the past few years into biodiversity losses. I mean, I will at this point say I, I would guess, especially given current interest, that most people in the room know approximately what I'm talking about when I say biodiversity, but just in case there are a few people out there who don't. Um, we have all sorts of very technical definitions of biodiversity and we spend a lot of time arguing about it, but it's a, essentially what we mean when we say biodiversity is, is the variety of life on the planet. Animals, plants, fungi and all the other, um, all the other species that are out there. And we know, you know there's a lot of science now building up to suggest that, that biodiversity is uh, in decline. So the, the big international biodiversity report that, that came out in May of this year estimated that something around a million species are likely to be threatened with extinction as a result of human actions. And the reasons I estimated, so you know, it's, it's um, difficult for me as a scientist to be introduced as giving you the truth because of course you know we never know with absolute certainty that we're right but we do we are getting increasingly confident um, in these estimates and, and, and you know we are very confident that there are very large losses of biodiversity but of course we you know we use words like estimate predict you know we we don't know everything, we don't have all the data that we need, and we never will. But we, you know, when I say estimate, we, you know, we, we're increasing in our confidence um, in what we know about biodiversity loss, and, and you know, it's very clear that, that the losses are very large. But one of the problems you know, that we face when making estimates like this of a million species being threatened with extinction is that you know, we haven't even officially discovered many of the species on the planet. And so all we can do is take the information that we've got and, 
and, and predict what's happening to everything else. And that's, you know, when, I, when I'm using terms like estimate and predict, that's reflecting that, that lack of information. And so as Jonathan also said, you know, we know that, that animals and plants also support us as humans. You know, we need pollinators for many of our crops, plants to ensure that soils remain healthy. And we think now that biodiversity loss has reached such a level that, that we can no longer be confident that, that it will continue to support those vital roles um, that, on which we rely, such as pollination. And so another figure which you may have come across, so the, every two years the, the WWF and the, the, the World Wide Fund for Nature and the Zoological Society of, of London compiled the Living Planet Report where they um, assessed the status of biodiversity. Um, and, the, and the latest one that was released um, back in 2018, last year, you know, estimated that around three-fifths of um, animal populations, the, the animal populations have declined by around three-fifths since 1970. And of course, most recently, insects have started to make the news. Um, so this is one of the you know, I said earlier that we, one of, the, one of the problems in studying biodiversity is that some of the information that we need is very hard to come by. And that's particularly true of insects. You know, they have been much less studied over the years, but we are now starting to get a lot more information. And that's suggesting that the situation may be even worse when we look at insects than for other groups. Um, and, and, you know, for the past couple of years, there have been some big landmark studies that, that have highlighted the large declines that we're seeing um, among insects. And of course, this is important for us because actually it's the insects, um, of, of the animals at least, it's the insects that, that do the most important jobs for us, um, like pollination um, and waste removal um, within natural systems. So I guess if most of you have an you know, impression of what ecology is, you, know, you would probably think of these sorts of activities, uh, being out in the fields, catching birds, or moths, or looking at the plants. And of course, this is a very important part of ecology, and it, and it generates all that raw information that we, that we need to understand what's happening to biodiversity. But there's another branch of ecology and, and, and the bit to which I belong, which is much more nerdy. I spend most of my time sat behind a computer, sometimes using these sorts of facilities that we have at, at UCL, but gathering together all of that information and trying to, putting it into computers and, and trying to build up a picture of what's happening. Um, across the whole world. So, um, if you're using social media, I'd, you know, I'm very, I'd encourage you to, to tweet about the, the things that I, that I talk about today. But I will say that, that some of this is still work in progress. It hasn't been published yet. And our scientific journals get very upset if we steal their thunder. Um, and so I would ask, you know, if if you see this you no know, tweeting symbol, please don't share that information because it's part of papers that are still being written and, and, and will hopefully soon be published. So when I was invited to give this talk, um, Bill said. 
you know, Italians can talk about climate change and biodiversity, um, and that you're particularly interested in hearing about solutions. Now, I'll just ask you to bear with me for a while on that. I'm going to start not by talking about climate change, but talking about habitat loss. And I will at the end come back to solutions. But firstly, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the science that, that, that we've been doing that highlights the problem and, and then eventually leads us towards an understanding of what some of the solutions might be. And I hope it will become clear by the end of the talk why I started with talking about habitat loss. I will come back around to climate change um, and, and I'll try to explain why, why it's important first to think about habitat loss. Um, so at the moment, habitat loss has the, is, is causing the biggest declines in, in biodiversity. Uh, Jonathan already actually mentioned this in his, um, in his uh, introductory remarks. Um, but you know, it's pretty clear when you, know, you look at an image like this, the profound effects that we have on habitats when we take natural forest and, and turn it into farmland. And if we look at a, a map of the world, um, I'm not sure actually the colours are coming out very well, um, but hopefully you can see the, the sort of green areas, which is where natural habitat is remaining. The yellowy areas are those that we use for farming. And then you probably can't see these, but there are some pink dots around which are the urban centres. Um, and what you know, what you can see is that a, a very large amount of the of the world's land service is used up by by for human farming, um, and it's around a half currently. And um, and what we find to so some some research that I was involved in a few years ago. Um, gathering together all of the information that we could from all around the world on you know, what happens if we turn natural habitats, forests, grasslands um, into farmland. And what we found was that we could see up to a three quarters loss of animal and plant species in these most disturbed farmland and urban habitats in, in cities. And I should say here, so through this talk, when I, when I talk about losses like this, I'm not talking about extinction of species. Sometimes, um, so, so, so what I'm talking about is, you know, if you go to this place, this, this farmland, then we might see three quarters of the, of the animals and plants that were there are no longer there. But of course, those animals and plants may still be found in nature reserves and other places. And it's a, commonly these two things get muddled up and it's been a particular problem in the debate around insect declines because sometimes people are taking these sorts of figures to mean global extinctions, which they're not. But they are important because they're the first step on the road towards extinction species. So it's not to say that we don't have a problem, but just that we need to be careful in the, you know, that, that, that these numbers are not the same as, as global extinction. And so what we find then, if we look across the whole world and we average out those places that, where biodiversity is doing okay, so where we still have a lot of natural habitats, um, biodiversity is doing okay, and the places where you have a lot of farmland and biodiversity is doing badly. If we average all of those things out, what we see is a, a loss of a one-fifth of biodiversity across the whole world. It 
the one thing that, that's clear is that not all animals and plants do badly. Of course, you know, if you go to any city or farmland, you know, if you go to farmland out around here in East Anglia, I live in some just up the road in, in Cambridgeshire, you know, there are hundreds of pigeons and rats. And you might have noticed as well, you know, that there are lots of green woodpeckers around now. Um, they're doing very well. And so something that we are, that we're very interested in is what, what it is about these animals and plants that makes them do very well. Um, and, you know, which ones do very well and which ones do, do badly. And so something that we looked at last year was to, to look at all of these animals and plants that are found in all over the world or, or over very large parts of the world and to take animals and plants that are found in very small areas. So this is a gecko that's found in a couple of tiny little patches in Madagascar. And to see whether you know, these sorts of things are faring better than, than these. And that's exactly you know, what we found. So, so all of the animals and plants that are, that are found in small areas, you know, they're going down by around a half on average. And these sorts of animals and plants that are found all over the place, they're all doing very, they tend to be doing very well. And they're going up by about a half. And this is a little bit like, you know, what you see with, with our high streets, so, you know, small shops Unique local shops are being replaced by large chains. They said the same thing to the banks, you know, a lot of the, lot of the world's money is now dominated by a few large banks. And this is important, you know, in the same way that, you know, in the financial crisis, the shops rippled through the system much quicker because everything is within a few large banks. You know, we know that the same thing happens in natural systems, but if we have lots of these sorts of things that are found everywhere, that the shops ripple through the system much more quickly than in the, the natural state when we have lots of these sort of unique animals and plants. And another reason that we should be worried about this as humans is that many of these animals and plants that do very well um, and, you know, with human activities are those things that carry human diseases. Since the work that we've got on the go at the moment is showing that you know, while most animals and plants are lost when we turn natural habitats into farmland or cities, that those animals and plants that carry human disease do really, really well. Things like bats, flying foxes, rodents, including this rat that carries Lassa fever, found in West Africa. And these things can go up by as much as 150% in those farm, the farms and the cities. So, you know, habitat loss currently is um, having the biggest effect on biodiversity. But of course now climate change is becoming an increasing issue. I, don't, I just included this, I don't know if you've seen these before, so these are some graphics that are made by a climate scientist from Reading called Ed Hawkins. Um, and I think they're a very persuasive way of showing the evidence about, about climate change. So basically from right to left, you've got a, so sorry, from left to right, you've got a series of years, with the most recent years being towards the right. Bluer colours are colder years, red colours are hotter years. So this shows very clearly in a way that, you know, scientific graphs can't, that the hottest years have all been in the past, most of the hottest years have been in the past 10 or 15 years.
Does anyone have any idea what this is? It's not, no, not a field gas. It's close. It's yes. So this is the Bramble K mosaic tailed rat. And I guess from your reaction that that doesn't mean anything to you. So this is the, the first mammal that has been driven to extinction by climate change. So it was found on this tiny speck of land called Bramble K, um, which is just off the Great Barrier Reef in, um, off Australia. Um, and as a result of climate change and the consequent sea level rise, the habitat was lost and, and, the, and it went extinct. We've been, I do some work on mammals, but um, in, with, with climate change, I've been doing a bit of work recently looking at bumblebees. Um, and this is some work together with um, two fantastic collaborators from the University of Ottawa in Canada. Um, and bumblebees are interesting for, for a number of reasons. I mean, one thing is that they don't tend to do too badly with habitat loss. You know, at least most species don't do too badly with habitat loss. But they seem to be very sensitive to climate change. And another reason that they are very interesting, I mean, this is true of many insects, but um, also true of bumblebees, that they are important pollinators of many of the crops that we like to eat, including many of the very nice fruits and nuts. And so we've been doing a bit of work trying to understand what's happening to bumblebees, why it's happening, um, and then they think about what might happen in the future and, and why this might be important when we think about you know, pollination of these, of these crops. And so what we're finding so far is that over the last hundred or so years, since, since the beginning of the 20th century, bumblebees have, have declined as a result, just of climate change. So we're trying to sort of tease apart effects of habitat climate change. And I'll come back to that in a minute. As a result of just climate change, we think bumblebees have gone down by around 4% across Europe over the past 100 years. Which, you know, that maybe doesn't sound like a lot. I will come back to that. You know, but it's worth remembering that so far we've experienced a relatively small amount of climate change. Um, and, you know, we're already seeing these sorts of declines. Now, the reason that I spent quite a bit of time at the beginning of the talk talking about uh, habitat loss was that, you know, what, one of the things that we're particularly interested in at the moment is that you know, climate change and habitat loss are happening alongside one another. And we're interested in, you know, how these, how these things might combine together and what that might mean for biodiversity. And the reason that we think this might be important is for a couple of reasons. So one thing is that, you know, when when the climate warms, animals and plants need to be able to move. They need to be able to move towards the poles, and they need to be able to move up mountains in order to move to cooler places. Now, we've had periods of rapid climate change in the past, but at that time, you know, animals and plants were able to move through natural habitat, landscapes that were entirely covered in natural habitat. The problem that we have now with, with current climate change is that we've chopped down a lot of that natural habitat. And we know that you know, these agricultural habitats and our cities are you know, not able to sustain a majority of, of species. So this creates a problem for 
animals and plants to be able to move with this climate change. And what makes matters worse is that those places with farms and cities are hotter and drier than natural habitats. So you probably notice if you know, if you walk in a forest, and you come out into a farmland, you immediately notice it's hotter and it's drier. And of course this means that, you know, this is adding to the adding to climate change. There's this climate change happening across the whole planet, but in farmland and cities, there's even more heating and there's more drying. And so what this means is that when we look at what, this, what effect this has on biodiversity, it's that we see something like around four times bigger declines in biodiversity when we think about the way that, that habitat loss and climate change are combined together. So what we find now for, for bumblebees is that over those past hundred or so years, that now you know, habitat loss and, and climate change together have been responsible for around 16% decline um, in, in bumblebees. And we think that probably things are worse than that. In fact, the data suggests that things are worse than that. Um, and one of the reasons is that in coming up with these numbers, we're not taking into account pesticides, um, herbicides, fertilizers, and other sorts of intensification of agriculture. And then we can, this is where things start to get quite alarming, you know, we can predict what might happen into the future as, you know, we're expecting more habitat loss to happen, and particularly we're expecting a lot more climate change to happen. And so what we find now is that if we carry on as we are, so at the moment we're, you know, we're, we're pursuing a world of fossil fuels, what we call business as usual, then we see, we, we, we predict that there will be 60% declines in bumblebees across Europe by the end of this century, so by 2100. If we meet the Paris Climate Agreement, um, and we keep warming to more like one and a half or two degrees, things are a bit better, but because of these combined effects of climate change and habitat loss, we're still seeing, we're still predicting that there will be 40% declines of bumblebees across Europe. And where these losses will be felt is quite different depending where in Europe. So you know, places towards the north do a bit better because if, if bumblebees are able to move through those habitats, then you know, they'll, they'll reach the northern areas and those may do okay. May even actually gain a few bumblebees. But in the south we see very predicting very large declines, even complete losses in, in some places. So just a reminder, you know, we, we know that there are this whole suite of crops that, that but for which bumblebees are a very important pollinator. And of course, you know, if you look around some of these crops, one thing that's apparent is that Many of them are grown in southern Europe and the Mediterranean region, which is exactly where we're predicting those largest losses of bumblebee species.
So I said that eventually I'd, I'd get back to solutions. You know, a lot of a lot of the work that we've done on biodiversity in the past 25 years has been about either about looking at what's happened, documenting the losses that we've seen, or more recently when we've been trying to make predictions, it's been along the lines of, you know, if this happens, then this is what will happen to biodiversity. So yeah, if we carry on on our business as usual trajectory, fossil fuel development, this might happen. Yeah, if we if we stick to the Paris Climate Agreement, then it might be better, this might happen. But in the past two, three or so years, we've also been starting to, to switch the way that we approach these predictions. And, and you know, instead of saying, if this happens, then this, will, this is what will happen to biodiversity, we started saying, well, okay, let's assume that, you know, we want biodiversity to improve. This is the future that we want to achieve for biodiversity. So if that's our target, what do we need to do to get there? And of course, this sort of idea has been around in climate science for a while. So people can say, well, if we want to keep warming within two degrees, within one and a half degrees, what do we need to do? And so this has led to the idea of what are called climate wedges. So a suite of actions that if we, if we adopted them, then we could you know, move towards a world of two degrees, one and a half degrees. And, you know, things around technology, preservation of natural habitats, and Jonathan mentioned that loss of habitats is a massive source of carbon emissions, and behavioural changes, such as dietary changes. And what other biodiversity researchers have found is that you know, just looking at the impacts of climate change on biodiversity, that if we were to follow these sorts of actions, if we were to move from a world of fossil fuels to something where we could meet the Paris Climate Agreement, that we could reduce the numbers of species that, that are very badly impacted by climate change from around a half to around a fifth. And we started to think about doing the same sort of thing for habitat bars. There's this some, some new work that's been commissioned by the World Wildlife Fund to try and come up with a, a similar approach to biodiversity loss to say, well, okay, if we want to reverse biodiversity times, what do we need to do? What are the biodiversity wages? And of course, many of these are very similar to, to those things that will help with climate change, protecting natural habitats, farming in a better way, changing people's diets, because we're reducing food waste. And so what we found with, with that work is that actually if we, if, we put in, if we were to put into a place a suite of actions, so preserving natural habitats, changing people's diets, farming more efficiently, that we could actually reverse biodiversity declines because of habitat loss. But as I said earlier in the talk, you know, one of the one of the sort of new things that's emerging is that you know when we look at how climate change and, and habitat loss are combining, that the situation is much worse than if we look at just habitat loss or just climate change. And we still don't know what the solution to this is. You know, we're predicting very, very large declines of biodiversity when we think about how climate change and habitat loss are, are combining with one another. And we don't yet know quite how 
big the actions are that will be needed if we were to try and reverse biodiversity declines when we take into account both of these things going on at once. We have some ideas, you know. One thing that is clear is that you know, if animals and plants are going to be able to respond to climate change, that they need to be able to move through natural habitats. And so, you know, creating corridors of natural habitats through landscapes, restoring habitats, is certainly going to help um, animals and plants to, to move um, in response to climate change. So, you know, just not far from here in Cambridgeshire, uh, then this is the Great Fen project, so um, the plan is to link up a lot of the natural habitats that are found in the Cambridge Fens to create these more natural, restored, connected landscapes. So, just really to finish then, just returning to this Gramble Cave. I say it's held rats, plus um, But, you know, we're starting to, we're making better and better predictions about what's going to happen to biodiversity. You know, we know that the effects of habitat loss alone are having a very large impact. The effects of climate change, you know, it's already been seen in the extinction of species, like this rat. And of course, many, you know, I said at the beginning, so coming back to this problem of data, information, you know, there are many, many species, you know, we haven't even discovered them, and they're probably going extinct. And we're particularly concerned now, you know, that, that habitat loss and climate change are combined together to have even greater effects. You know, really now we're thinking about, you know, how do we, we're starting to come up with solutions to try and reduce climate change, reduce habitat loss. I guess we're still, you know, we're still trying to work out what the solutions are to try and deal with both things together. But certainly, you know, there's going to be big actions that are needed you know, to avoid many more extinctions of, of animals and plants like, like this one. Well, thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, please feel free to send messages over Twitter, you know, um, this is my website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. And we're going to take a little bit of time now to have any questions. So if anybody would like to ask any questions of Tim. We've got a flying microphone carrier. Um, please fire away. Hello, Tim, thank you for the talk. Um, we read a lot about the effect of climate change on the human population, uh, certain temperature control, certain percentages of human diet. But how real in those scenarios would be um, interconnected species collapse so that we see Biosystems. What sort of effects would that actually have on you know, the planet, the ecology, and the that's a That's a very good question. Um, our ability to answer that question very precisely is, you know, we, we still don't know. But certainly the indications are that, you know, if you if you lose enough species, then you can get these sorts of collapses. And the predictions that we make for climate change are for very large losses of species. And so taking those two things together, it certainly seems likely that that, they, that, that collapse becomes a, a very real possibility. But we still don't have enough information to know with certainty what will happen. But I mean, that makes it you know, more important to to act to try and prevent these things. We simply don't know what the implications are for that. Hi, Tim. Um, you said that more efficient farming would help 
with the Sloan Biodiversity Boss. Uh, could you expand on what you mean by more efficient farming? Yes. So there are a couple of sides to that, and the evidence is still um, not clear on which one it is the best. Um, so there, so there are two ways that um, that that, that you know, changes to farming can, can reduce biodiversity loss. So one is that we. You know, we have higher yielding farms over a smaller area. And there is you know, growing evidence that for many animals and plants, that's a good thing. Um, because it means that we can say, you know, preserve more natural habitats for those animals and plants to live in. The problem with that is that, you know, we, you know, as, I, as I've said, we need a lot of animals and plants in order to pollinate, to keep ecosystems healthy. And so there's a lot of interest at the moment in ideas around so sustainable intensification. So trying to improve yields, but doing it in a way that also preserves biodiversity. And there are many ways that that can be done um, in a mixed crop and keeping practice in natural habitat. Um, in England, what kind of species do you see being diminished? Can you give us some uh, ideas of what is going down, besides bumblebees? And... Um, yes, uh, so to bumblebees, uh, certainly. Um, many butterflies, not all. More moths, actually. So moths seem to be doing particularly badly. Um, and because we've lost a lot of our large mammals, and historically. Um, Tim, I wanted to ask you what you knew about the um, situation at Net Castle. Where uh, Isabella Tree and her husband have been finding an incredible comeback of species which uh, had disappeared previously, and they only started the project about 16 years ago. It was spectacular results. Yes, I I haven't visited yet. I would I would love to. Um, I have family, friends, and colleagues who have all been and, and said it's amazing. Um, so just for, for anyone that doesn't know, so the net estate in in uh, Sussex is, is an example of what um, ecologists and conservationists are calling rewilding. Um, and the idea is that you, um, rather than doing traditional conservation, you know, very interventionist, that you try and put back some of the animals and plants that would have, would have been there naturally. Large, typically large grazing animals. Um, and, and, and this is what they've done at Nepostate and, and um, also at some other places, and yes, as you say, I mean, it's been um, a tremendous success story. Um, there are lots of uh, birds and butterflies returning. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you had any sort of thoughts about monoculture versus uh, diversification into exotic species that yeah, can't safely remove from the environment. So, for example, oats and soybeans by diversity, when it was sort of a notion and suggestion I had in that regard. Yeah, so, you know, certainly we know that monoculture has fewer animals and plants than um, you know, more diversified farming systems. You know, because as I, as I said in response to one of the earlier questions, uh, an ongoing debate in conservation is whether it's better to do intensive farming monoculture over a small area and save more natural habitats or you know, have more diversified farming over larger areas but you're able to save less habitats. And that, it's still an open question and it's a very complicated question um, and it depends what sorts of animals and farms you care about. You didn't mention anything about the uh, only thing is that 
in the United States and were 10 years old, the six central pesticides were sold for putting on the garden, and 40% pesticides were for use, agricultural use. Uh, and when I listened to Barbara's question, I unfortunately want to throw the radio across the room when they advocate the planting of invasive foreign plants for wildlife. Yeah, um, so, so certainly when we look at insects, we know that gardening can make a, that the way that gardening is done can make a huge difference, for sure. Um, I mean, you know, the, a lot of the sorts of stuff that I do is looking at these big trends. Um, but, you know, there's another whole area of research that's into what can we do on, in farms, also in gardens, cities, to buck that trend. Um, and, yeah, I mean, gardening has a big effect on buying and such. Um, apart from the obvious stuff, like the age of So, uh, I mean, on a, on a personal level, um, you know, we know that diet has a very big effect because it both, you know, dietary changes both reduce climate change and they also reduce habitat loss. Yes. Yeah, so shifts toward more, towards more vegetarian diets reduce habitat loss and they reduce. Well, there are, yes, there are, it, it's not a totally straightforward thing to that. Um, but generally, more vegetable based diets, more plant based diets are certainly better in terms of habitat loss and climate change than, um, than uh, meat based diets. This wasn't going to be my question, but on the back of that, um, what do you think about organic versus non organic? I mean that. So that um, there is the, the same complication around that as there is around the intensive farming, diversified farming debate. I mean there are, of course, some additional factors with organic farming, the, the use of chemicals, of course, which we uh, which I suggest are bad for bees, particularly. Um, again, you know, I, I don't think the answer is clear. With, with the science, it doesn't give us a clear answer, and it depends which animals and plants again that we that we care about. You mentioned the um, collapse in the insect population, and it's gone down by about 75, 80 percent over 25 to 30 years, and you see that reflected in the um, food chain by you know normal sea swallows, very few swifts, the insect birds like flycatchers have all, all gone. Um, the, one of the drivers there were the neonicotinoids and uh, systemic insecticides which <clears throat> the EU finally um, heavily restricted about two years ago. Um, is anyone looking for any bounce back? And uh, if they are looking for any bounce back, what's your feeling as an ecologist of how, how quickly that might occur or whether it's going to be a really long process which is very difficult to actually differentiate from natural variation? I'm not aware yet that anybody has shown an increase following the ban of neonicotinoids. Um, but, I mean, you know, insect populations are resilient. Uh, you know, I, my prediction would be that they could bounce back and that, it, that, that given the right circumstances, it wouldn't take on. But of course, you know, we also know that all these other factors are going on. You know, we know that flying insects are very sensitive to climate change. Um, and a lot of the changes that we've seen in the bumblebees, you, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, there are studies that clearly link bumblebee declines to neonicotinoids. Um, in the work that we've done, there's also a very clear signal of climate change. Um, so I think you know, pesticides aren't the only factor. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I particularly related to the idea of biodiversity with wedges in rural areas and in forests. Um, my question is, have we given up on our cities, or is there a chance to implement things like those in our towns and cities, including Hitchin? 
Um, no, we haven't, we haven't given up on cities. I mean, I have colleagues that, who, who are hearing me on cities and, and particularly in London, thinking about ways to design better cities. Um, so there's a lot of work. So UCL are just opening their campus out um, near the old Olympic Park. Um, and as part of that redevelopment, they've actually been you know, designing nature reserves, designing places that are specifically targeted at, at improving biodiversity. Um, so yes, it can, it can make a big difference. I mean, there are you know, there are these big trends in habitat loss and, and climate change that are a major challenge, and solving them is you know, it's very difficult, and the solutions aren't yet. But there are many things that can be done at a local, at a local level that, that improve that situation. I think it's really talked about around that garden and better cities. Why do big mammals tend to be more effective than small insects? That's yeah, that's a very good that's a very good question. They are certainly more affected by some things, um, and you know, what, one of the main reasons that we think that is true is that they breed much more slowly. It's a lot longer to produce a mammal than it does to produce an insect. Um, but you know, we have it, what, what's becoming clear though is that, you know, as, as I've said, that climate change has a very big effect on flying insects, and I think that's still. Yeah, something that we're only really coming to understand now because insects have been so little studied in the area of mammals. But yeah, there are there are many reasons why we know that mammals are large mammals are um, particularly affected by a certain thing, particularly habitat. We only have time for two more questions. This gentleman has been waiting for a while. Thanks. Um, you've said several times it depends which plants and animals. Um, you, you, uh, you, you care about, so which plants and animals should we care about? <laughs> that uh, could, could probably take me a couple of years to answer. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, at heart, I'm an entomologist. I love to be able to study insects when I can. Um, I mean, guessing, as I've said several times, you know, getting data is very, very difficult. Insects, but you know we we know that, that insects are fundamental. Uh, we know that they're very you know, very important for providing pollination, many other roles within natural systems, um, and it's becoming clear that they that they've declined a lot more while we've not been collecting data on them. Um, so I mean I I care about insects, but um, I think. It's a very difficult question to answer um, because many, many species provide many, many different roles. Um, and, you know, it's, it's clear that whatever we do, we're going to lose some. Um, and, and how we prioritise is, is a very, very difficult problem. Uh, hi, Tim. Thank you very much for your talk. It was uh, really insightful. Um, my question, as an ecologist myself, we know that there's several species in the UK that are protected by law um, and have been over various different years. Is it expected that we will gain more species that are protected by law because of climate change? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess I. I don't think I can answer it, you know, because there's there are several factors that, that lead to us you know, species being protected. I mean, I guess one would hope that declines with climate change will lead to more species being protected. Whether that happens um, is you know, a matter of you know, governments to decide. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think I know the answer. Well, I'd like to say a huge thank you, Tim, for an amazing presentation. And I'm sure you'd like to join me in saying thank you one, one more time. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, we are under time constraints, obviously, in the town hall, so um, we'd now like to ask Tim to take a break. And the bar is still going to be open, and our lovely sponsors and guests around the side are going to be here for the next few minutes if you'd like to go and have another look at the tables. There are also some donation buckets. This evening and the following three talks are being sponsored by us. Um, it's the, the money that's going into the buckets is not going to the Green Party, it's going to these events. So if you do have a few pennies in your pocket, please put them in there. Hopefully we can roll it on to the next talk and the one after that and the one after that. Thank you so much for coming this evening. I hope you've learnt something and you feel that you can move on from this subject with a little bit more knowledge. And hopefully we'll see you again in a couple of weeks' time for our sustainable fashion and a life with less. And um, please enjoy the last few minutes. The bar is still open. And I'm sure Tim will be wandering around if you wanted to speak to him personally. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.